So thanks for the invite for um, allowing me to give this talk today. Um, this is a project called Climate Smart Grasslands, um, which is much better than the title that runs underneath it. Um, and it's about, it's actually a, a project which is joint between Bangor University, Aberystwyth University, and the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology based in Bangor. And it's funded by Welsh Government and employs um, three postdocs and a PhD student. And it's just started, so there's not many, much data here. Um, and it's supported by the Met Office, NRW, which is Environment Agency, Forestry Commission, etc., and Germinal Seeds, who are the uh, grass breeding company. So the reason for this project is because um, Welsh Government are interested in trying to preserve um, the Welsh cultural landscape. And as most of you know, the Welsh cultural landscape implies lots of grassland and lots of sheep. And, um, and although you know, there's arguments for and against the preservation of that sort of uh, um, agricultural system, it's not very sustainable for a start. Um, you know, from a cultural perspective, if we got rid of sheep from the, from the Welsh countryside, it's been described as cultural genocide. So um, there's a strong movement at the moment to keep grass and sheep and cows on the Welsh landscape. Um, but yet we're, we're challenged at the moment with some of these extreme events which are happening, and the top one um, is the Conway Valley where we live, um, which is actually is a period of intense flooding uh, from last year, where actually this is a sacrificial floodplain which is used um, to protect local communities to stop flooding of houses. Basically, the agricultural land is sacrificed and goes underwater for, for several weeks, if not months sometimes. And then on the Somerset levels and the Severn, um, we had land that was underwater for up to three months, and sometimes the water was up to three metres deep um, on those grasslands. But it's not just confined to the UK, of course. It's in other parts of the world, um, as we can see at the bottom in the USA, Mozambique, etc. But similarly, we have another challenge, which we don't see very often in, in Wales, but does happen on rare occasions, these extreme events where we have droughts. Um, and 1976 is a good example of that. And so we also have to protect grasslands against intense floods and intense drought periods. And the Met Office and various others are predicting that these are going to be of increasing frequency, and we're already seeing impacts now. One thing that we don't really hear too much about is the increasing levels of tropospheric ozone. Um, currently, we're operating around 40 ppb. Um, but as soon as you get above 40 ppb, we start it. Well, we see damage at 40. But above that, in these extreme events, um, such as the one in July 2011, um, where you see high tropospheric ozone, you get damage to stomata. Um, and all sorts of other um, physiological impacts associated with plants which reduce productivity, which is another um, associated with heat stress, typically. So this project is about looking at the interactions of these stresses, and particularly flood, ozone, and drought. And in a sense, it's looking at the perfect storm scenario, where sometimes we might have a winter flood, which might be followed by a summer drought. And the summer drought might also be um, occurring at the same time as elevated tropospheric ozone. And in some cases, we might have all three happening within one year. In fact, that is highly likely. But the interactions between these stresses are actually not very well understood, particularly for grasslands. And on top of that, we have some other stresses, such as wind, UV, excess heat is common under the ozone scenarios, of course. And um, we might have some invasive pests, which we're not dealing with. But of the other ones, they're, they're in, our, in this project. And what we're interested in identifying is whether tipping points exist for these grassland ecosystems and whether um, we can devise strategies to prevent that tipping point from happening or from passing over that tipping point. So this is just a, um, a schematic diagram of microbial community structure in soils because this is an above and below ground project. And the green dots indicate the natural cycle of that microbial grassland community during the year. So it's not stable, it's continually going around and it goes back to a stable state each year. Occasionally, when we have stresses, such as in scenario two, the microbial community shifts, but ultimately comes back to that natural cycle. When we have this extreme stresses, um, particularly we put hypothesizing that when you have multiple um, extreme stresses happening in a year, we might pass over a tipping point and head to a new state of those microbial communities, and we have not really much understanding about what the impact will, that will have on the ecosystem service function. So just some indicators of some of the damage that, uh, that floods can cause. We've had a, a number of projects funded by DEFRA 
and Nurk on this sort of area. Um, here's Dave Chadwick sampling the waters. Flood water, of course, takes with it a lot of our natural capital in the soil that washes out into the into marine waters. So every time you see a brown river, you're, you know, you should be thinking natural capital loss. Similarly, when the flood water passes away, you often get this black layer in the soil. So um, lots of iron sulphide and hydrogen sulphide being produced, and obviously we get death of grass. In terms of ozone damage, it's not just about the death of the above ground structures and necrosis, um, it's also about the impacts on below ground functioning. And one of the uh, work that has been done is about the impacts of ozone. Here we're going from 33, which is a fairly low level of, of topospheric ozone, up to 66, which is cl classic of a, an event in the summer, um, reducing um, the amount of nitrogen fixation that's going on. And it's, a, it's understanding how those above and below ground interactions operate. In the, in the DEFRA project, we also noticed that on the left-hand side here, you can see swards that were under flood water for three months, completely unaffected. Newly established swards that were two years old, almost completely lost. So there's something about the resilience of the communities on the left that provides flood tolerance. And it seems to be that um, that's associated with below and above ground structures. So does grassland biodiversity promote resilience? And can we better engineer uh, more uh, tolerant grassland communities? So part of the project is with ibis. And ibis have a specialism, of course, in breeding grasses. And the idea is to take um, festuca lines from across Europe and blend these into lolium um, to provide tolerance. So you can see that some of them, um, the, the ones from the Mediterranean regions, of course, are more drought tolerant. And some from the north are more cold tolerant and also flood tolerant. And the first um, festulolium line developed by ABBA, uh, IBIS there, ABBA niche was um, put on the natural, national list at 2012, 2014, and there's some more just coming through the process now. So the, the idea is to capitalize on some of these new varieties that have greater stress tolerance. So there's just some examples. They, of course, they all have, when you start breeding these festuc and lolium lines together, you get completely different um, phenotypes. And some of them are low, low level spreading, and some of them are more erect, which you know, would imply that they're going to have um, different tolerances to different stresses, possibly. But also, what's more important is that below ground, they are very different. Some of them are very deep rooting, and some of them are more shallow rooting. So the key goals of the research program are to understand how grasslands respond to these multiple stress events, determine tipping points, to get these new festulolium grasses um, and test them out in the field, and to provide, um, ultimately, is to use Germinal as the seeding seed company to, to promote these. So the project has just started. It's been running for about three months now, um, and we're in the initial stages of building the, uh, um, the infrastructure, really, and employing all the postdocs. But the breeding has started. It's been going with another project called Shore Root, which is one of Mike's other projects um, funded by BBSRC. And I'm not going to go into this too much, but ultimately, you know, in 10 years' time, we end up down the bottom here where we're trialling things out on far with farms. So we have something called Bangor Extreme, which is a field facility um, which has flood plots in it and drought plots. You can see the infrastructure here. The flood water for the spring flood is due to go on um, next week. And these plots will be flooded, and we'll be looking at the interactions between, um, the, in comparison to a control, we have a winter flood, we have a summer flood, we have a summer drought, and we have a winter flood plus summer drought comparison. Um, so those are the, the treatments that are going to go on. And we also have um, one of the, the country's only free ozone air and enrichment experiments on the right-hand side there, the ozone rings and the solar domes, which allow us to do controlled ozone exposure and controlled heat at the same time. So we'll be using the CH solar domes. And the breeding will go on at the National Phenomic Centre at IBIS. And this is it in motion. And here's an example of, of what can be done. This is looking at root distribution in these root columns from these different uh, festulolium um, lines and this is just a time window of just a, a spread of a couple of weeks here monitoring root changes and the, obviously the phenomic center can pick up all the distribution in roots and here's just an example of two lines um, looking at how those root systems develop um, down those soil columns and we're basically we're using the phenomic center to really pull out those lines which we think have deeper rooting which gives us great, greater drought tolerance 
and also possibly um, allows um, greater flood to tolerance in, in promoting drainage and other things. So there's some field multiplication going on at the moment, which is one of the major limiting factors about getting this out there to farmers. And lastly, I just want to talk about some of the work that we did under the DEFRA program, which is about remediation measures. So we know that plants can't do everything, and we know that when we have extreme events, um, it leaves the soil in an incredibly poor condition. And some of it is about agronomy, and it's about getting big bits of kit out there, um, ploughing up fields, with subsoilers or sward lifters to look at um, whether uh, these can mitigate against some of the damage that's caused by some of these flood and drought events. Um, all the evidence suggested from when this is on the Somerset levels, after the, after the grass had been under water for three, three months and then um, out for about four months, when you could get machinery back on the land. Actually, the sward doesn't look too bad here, but when you get down and close to it, it's pretty poor. Um, none of these interventions that are used by UK farmers had any impact whatsoever, so we definitely need some new strategies there. So in conclusion, this is a new project. It's probably early days to report on it, really. Um, we're looking at the interactions between these stresses rather than single stresses in isolation. So ozone, heat, drought and flood are the main ones that we'll be investigating. We want to identify tipping points for grasslands, um, using an ecosystem services approach, so looking at greenhouse gas emissions, and, and, uh, carbon sequestration and biodiversity and all sorts of things like that, as well as productivity. The idea is to develop these new stress-tolerant grass varieties. We have some already, but it's a continually ongoing program. Um, to put these new sward mixtures out into the field and evaluate them, and also to develop new remediation measures. So, In reality, we're probably looking at practical solutions by... 2025, 2030, I would say, at the earliest. Okay, and I think that is it. The list of the names of all the people involved in the program is in the abstracts, um, if anybody's interested about who's, who's in and who's out. Thanks very much.